What's up, everybody, and welcome back to OpenStax Algebra and Trigonometry Chapter 3 Practice Test. Let's do it. Question number one, determine whether the following relation is a function. So this, if you might recognize it, is actually a linear function, right? Because there's no exponents for x or y, so it's a nice linear function. It's actually going to have a slope of 2, a y-intercept of 8. It's going to look something like this, okay? And the key with the relation, rec recognizing whether or not it's a function, is would it pass the vertical line test? And a linear function will pass the vertical line test, as long as it's, it's not a vertical line. So this definitely, yes is a function boom done for number three we are trying to find what is the value of f of negative two which all this means in function notation is we're plugging negative two in for every instance of x so check it out it's negative three times negative two squared plus two times negative two like so negative two squared is four four times negative three is negative twelve plus two times negative two which is negative four negative twelve plus negative four is negative sixteen boom so in this question, we're asked to show that this is not a one-to-one -one function. So I'm going to show you this generally. Now, when we look at this equation, we see that x is to the second power. What does that mean? That means that this is a parabola. So if we did a very rough sketch, okay, and since this is in vertex form, I can see that my vertex is at 1, 3, so 1 on the x-axis, 3 on the y-axis, and it's got a negative over here, which means it's going down, okay? Uh, and so I'm not going to, I'm not going to draw too many details, but essentially it looks like this. It's a, it's a downward facing parabola and any downward or upward facing parabola is not one-to-one -one because it's going to fail that horizontal line test. Meaning I can draw a horizontal line and hit more than one point on the function. So this thereby shows that any parabola, especially this one is not one-to-one -one. boom done. For this one, we're meant to find f of a plus 1 minus f of 1. So we're going to take this step by step. First, we're finding f of a plus 1, meaning a plus 1 is going to be plugged in for every instance of x, minus f of 1, where 1 will be plugged in for every instance of x. So let's write that out. So over here is f of a plus 1. So you see every instance of x. There was an x squared, now it's a plus 1 squared. There was a minus 5x, now it's minus 5 times a plus 1. So I just slid that a plus one into every instance of x likewise over here and i put this whole thing in parentheses because it's minus that entire function so that's why i put this in these outside parentheses instead of x squared it's one squared instead of five times x it's five times one so i slipped that in there now we're going to evaluate and simplify first things first a plus one squared is really a squared plus a times one plus a times one which is two a again remember a plus one squared is really a plus one times a plus one so i'm just foiling it out we got the a squared, 1a, 1a, that's the 2a in the middle. And then 1 times 1 is just a 1. And again, we're going to have to distribute that 2 at some point, so we'll do that shortly. Here I'm going to distribute that 5. It's minus 5a minus 5, like so. Here I'm going to try and evaluate this all in one step. So 1 squared is 1 times 2 is 2, minus 5 times 1. 5 times 1 is 5. So 2 minus 5 is negative 3. So it's minus negative 3. Now, of course, double negative becomes a plus and we can combine these guys. Likewise, we'll simplify this out like so. So we have 2a squared plus 4a, right? 2 times 2a, plus 2 times 1, which is 2, minus 5a, and then negative 5 plus 3 is negative 2. These guys will cancel. 5a negative and 4a makes a negative 1a. There is your winner. Boom. Here, we're meant to find the average rate of change by plugging this function into this formula. So we're going to check it out as follows. f of b is simply f of x with every instance of x being replaced by b. So we have that right here. And then f of a would be every instance of x now being replaced with a. So again, it's 3 minus 2a squared plus a over, and then we have b minus a on the bottom. Now, as we simplify this, I'm going to distribute that negative, and we're going to see if we can combine any like terms. So we have 3 minus 2b squared plus b on top minus 3 plus, right, negative times negative becomes plus 2a squared. Negative times a becomes minus a all over b minus a. Now, this 3 and this negative 3 are going to cancel out. And then we got 2b squared, negative 2b squared plus b plus 2a squared minus a. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to group these two guys together, and then I'm going to group these two guys together. You're going to see what happens. It's pretty cool. So out of the first two, I'm going to factor out a negative 2, right? 
So I got negative 2, and then inside I've got b squared minus a squared, okay? Because if I factor out a negative 2 from the b squared, it's just b squared. Factor out a negative 2 from here, it's got to be negative a squared. And then for these guys, it just goes together as b minus a, right? We're left over with that. And this is going to get pretty interesting uh, in terms of simplification. And this is going to get pretty interesting in terms of simplification as we see the b squared minus a squared. So let's take it from there. So just shrinking this down to give us a little bit more room, that b squared minus a squared then factors into b minus a b plus a as follows, and then plus again b minus a. So what do we see out of this numerator? I can now factor out the b minus a. So check it out. I have b minus a on the outside times negative 2 b plus a. Okay, we'll keep that like this plus one, because what am I pulling this out of? There, there's an invisible one there, so I'm pulling out the b minus a from this term and from this term. So now I've got b minus a times negative two times b plus a plus one over b minus a. Last but not least, I can cancel this and this out. And now we're left with our final answer, negative two times b plus a plus one for the win, boom, for the following exercises, use the functions to find g of f of 1. And I'm going to rewrite this as follows. It's equivalent in terms of what it means, but I like this formatting better. So g of f of 1. So the way I like to proceed with one of these questions is go from the inside out. So first I want to find what is f of 1. So I'm going to plug 1 in to x for both instances of x for f of x. So f of 1 is 3 minus 2 times 1 squared. 1 squared is 1 times 2 is 2, so 3 minus 2 plus 1. 3 minus 2 is 1 plus 1 equals 2. Then, since f of 1 is 2, now I'm taking g of 2. So I'm taking the 2 and I'm plugging it in here. So it's simply square root of 2, which can't be simplified. There's your winner. Boom. Done. So when we look at this function, it's a transformation of the parent function square root of x, which typically looks like this, okay? It kind of looks like this shooting off, okay? And what's the transformation being applied? It looks like we're going to the left by 6. When we add 6 underneath the radical, that's going to the left by 6. And then we're minusing 1, we're going down by 1. So if we were to transform this, we go left by 6 and down by 1. So that's a quick way to kind of get our function graph. But we're also going to verify this with a quick table starting at negative 6. Now, the reason why I'm starting with negative 6 is because negative 6 is where this radical part zeroes out, and that's a good starting point. And then I'm also going to include a couple other values. Now, obviously, we can't take a square root of a negative. That won't be a real number. So my next value would be negative 5. Now I'm going to choose carefully. I'm not going to go negative 4. I'm going to do the next value of x that's going to give me a nice perfect square. That would be negative 2 because negative 2 plus 6 gives me 4. Square root of 4 is 2. So now let's get our corresponding values. Negative 6 plus 6 is 0 minus 1, negative 1. Negative 5 plus 6 is 1. Square root of 1 is 1 minus 1 is 0. Uh, negative 2 plus 6 is 4. Square root of 4 is 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. So now we got three nice points. We got negative 6, negative 1. We got negative 5, 0, and we got negative 2, positive 1. This looks exactly like what we had with just the transformations. Now we can connect the dots, put a little arrow, boom, done. To determine whether a function is odd or even, we need to plug in f of negative x and see what happens. So watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to plug in negative x, right, for every instance of x plus 9 times negative x to the 6th power. Now we're going to see what happens. Well, negative x squared is just x squared, right? The negatives cancel out, so I'm left with just negative 5 over x squared. doesn't affect this negative in front. And then negative x to the 6, again, it's an even exponent. So a negative times itself 6 times is going to end up being positive. Well, what does that mean? That means that this new function, after I plug negative x in, looks exactly like the original. When that happens, it means that this function is indeed even, right? No coincidence that both of the exponents here are even numbers. So that's oftentimes can be a giveaway. It's not definitive, but it's a good in indication. Like if every exponent is even, it's probably going to be an even function. So there it is. There's the test. Even. Boom. Done. 
For this one, once again, to determine if it's even or odd, we're gonna plug in negative x and we get one over negative x. So what's happened? The function did not stay the same. In fact, it's completely flipped. Everything is flipped, right? It was positive one over x, now it's negative one over x. Since everything is flipped, this means the function is odd, which also means that it's symmetric about the origin. Boom, done. For this function, we're meant to find the inverse. And the first way that I start an inverse question is change f of x to y. Next, I'm going to swap the x's and the y. So I'm going to say x equals 3y minus 5. And then I'm going to isolate y. So I'm going to add 5 to both sides. And then I'm going to divide by 3, divide by 3, boom. And I get y equals x plus 5 over 3. And this is indeed the inverse function, but now we want to put it in that nice function notation, which is inverse, I do f to the negative 1 of x, inverse of x, of f of x, excuse me, is x plus 5 over 3, boom, done. This question asks on what interval is the function increasing? What does increasing mean? Increasing means a positive slope, right? So it has a positive slope all here up to this max point, and then it goes negative. And then it again is a positive slope, meaning going from left to right, it's going up. Positive slope from there on out as well. Notice the, there are arrows here and here. So where is this? And we're going to approximate, right? So it looks like it's increasing from negative infinity, right? It's going all the way to the left forever and ever up to, and I'm just gonna approximate and say that's negative 1.1. It's a little bit to the left of negative one. And then we're gonna union that with this new zone. And then we're just going to estimate again that that's roughly 1.1 to infinity. And I'm sure your teacher's gonna allow a little leeway here. This is what is explicitly written in the back of the book, 1.1 and negative 1.1. But I'm sure there'll be some leeway. So that's how you do it, boom done. Approximate the local minimum of the function, and the minimum is going to be what I say is the bottom of a valley. That's how I like to describe a local minimum, and it looks like it's happening right here. And again, we're going to approximate. So as we mentioned in question 21, this minimum or this point where the function is now switching to increasing looks like it's occurring roughly at 1.1. Now for an approximation of the y value, it looks just above negative 1, which might be negative 0.9. That's a decent approximation. Boom, done. For this one, it says find f of 2, meaning find the function value when x equals 2. So here's when x equals 2. What is the function value? Well, the function value is where there is that solid point, not the hollow point, because that's showing the function actually doesn't exist right there, but it's starting there and then progressing onwards. So the actual function value of f of 2 is going to be 2, on the y-axis, so two is the winner, boom, done. For this question, we're meant to write a piecewise function, so we're gonna do that as follows. I'm gonna try and do this in only two functions. And I think we can do that because this up to this can ju just be a nice absolute value function, and then over here, this is a nice constant function. So we're gonna break it up first for the absolute value function, that's gonna exist when x is less than or equal to two, because it's at two and then it goes on and on forever to the left. And the other one is gonna be x is greater than two. So why did I say greater than and not greater than or equal to? Because it actually doesn't exist right at the point of two. It's greater than two. So that's why we have those parameters. So now what is this absolute value function? Well, it looks pretty much like a standard absolute value, right? It's centered at zero, zero, and it's got a slope of one to the right, negative one to the left. So that is simply a nice absolute value function, boo. Um, we'll put a little comma there to separate it out with the kind of uh, inequality. And then what about here? We've got it as f of x simply equals 3, right? It's like a constant function. It's like y equals 3. So that's it going to the right from x is greater than 2. And there's our nice piecewise. Boom, done. So for this one, they want us to solve the equation f of x equals 5. And what they're really asking is for what value of x does the function equal 5? So the function is 5 right here. What's that corresponding value of x? It's right here. When x equals 2, the function value equals 5. So x equals 2. Boom. Done. So this question asks, is the function represented by the graph 1 to 1? I believe what they mean is the table, right? Because we're referring to the table in these exercises. And what I would say is, what is 1 to 1? So it, graphically, it's got to pass the horizontal line test. So something like this, right? But what does that mean when we're talking about a table? What it means 
is I don't want to have a repetition of Y value. So for example, if we have a parabola, it would fail that test. Why? Because over here, the Y value is five and over here, the Y value is five. It's repeated, hence it fails that horizontal line test. So the Y values are the function values, AKA this row. And guess what? I don't see any repetition of function values, right? I see one, three, five, seven, nine. They're all unique, which means the table is does indeed represent a one-to-one -one function. So yes, boom, done. Given that f of x equals negative 2x plus 11, find the inverse. So again, I'm gonna start by finding an inverse by changing f of x into y. Next, I'm gonna swap the x and y. So I'm gonna say x equals negative 2y plus 11. And then I'm gonna isolate y. So I'm gonna start by subtracting 11 from both sides. We have negative 2y equals x minus 11. And then I'm gonna divide by negative two, by negative two, boom. And we get y equals x minus 11 divided by negative two. Last but not least, put it in that nice function notation. Now I'm gonna swap out y with f inverse of x like so, and then repeat what we had written up there, x minus 11 divided by negative two, boom, done. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you did, please click that like button. And if you wanna see more from the Scalar Learning channel, make sure to click subscribe. Thank you guys so much for joining, and I'll see you in the next video. Take it easy.